Imagine Earth's surface swallowed by an ocean of fire, lava flowing uninterrupted for hundreds of thousands of years, skies choked by volcanic gases, seas poisoned, forests collapsing, life on land gasping. What could trigger such an apocalypse? Could anything like it happen again? Beneath those questions lies an extraordinary record. Two of the planet's most massive flood basalt provinces, the Deccan Traps of India and the Siberian Traps of Russia, reveal not only what Earth once was, but what it might become, given the mechanics of its internal engine. The Deccan and Siberian Traps are not mere curiosities of geological history. They are testimony to Earth's capacity for extreme change that its mantle and crust, slowly moving over tens of millions of years, can at critical moments unleash forces that dwarf human timescales. From them we learn where the thresholds lie, how much magma, how much gas, how fast before life falters. And though such catastrophes are rare on human timescales, the geological record demands we understand them deeply. What processes made the traps as devastating as they were? What linkages among mantle plumes, crustal composition and mass extinction events can be drawn? And what patterns in timing, volume and chemistry inform us about the possible future behaviour of Earth's geodynamics? In order to understand what Earth's future might hold, one must first peer back to the immense eruptions themselves. The Siberian traps erupted at the boundary between the Permian and Triassic periods about 252 million years ago and represent perhaps the greatest volcanic outburst in the Phanerozoic Eon. Lava flooded an area some 7 million square kilometres, roughly the size of India, and stacked layers of basalt several kilometres thick in many places. 30 to 40 million cubic kilometres of magma may have been involved. The eruption spanned not just centuries, but over a million years in its most active phases, with intense pulses that lasted thousands to tens of thousands of years. The Deccan Traps, by contrast, are younger, around 66 million years old, erupted during the late Cretaceous just before and overlapping with the mass extinction that ended the dinosaur era. The Deccan flows blanketed west-central India with lava covering perhaps one to one and a half million square kilometres at their greatest extent, building basalt sheets often over one kilometre thick. Several million cubic kilometres of basalt were erupted in pulses over perhaps half a million years or more. These events share key geological drivers. Deep mantle plumes, rifting of continental lithosphere, lithospheric weakening, and the intrusion of sill and dike networks that fed vast surface eruptions. In the case of the Siberian traps, plume material rose from the lower mantle, impinging upon continental crust. Under the sedimentary basins of what is now Siberia lay large deposits of coal, carbonate rocks, evaporites. As the plume's heat and magma intruded into these layers, it thermally altered them, cooking organic matter, releasing methane and other reduced carbon compounds, evaporating sulphates. At the same time, basaltic magma erupted at the surface, degassing carbon dioxide and sulphur dioxide directly into the atmosphere. In the Deccan case, the reunion plume under India similarly melted through thick continental crust. As magma ascended, its chemistry was modified by interaction with crustal rocks, xenoliths, isotopic signatures and trace element patterns in Deccan basalts show that the crust was not simply a passive conduit but a reactive ingredient. Volcanic gas emissions were paramount. Sulfur dioxide forms aerosols in the upper atmosphere that reflect sunlight producing cooling. Carbon dioxide drives warming, but on longer timescales. Methane from thermogenic sources enhances greenhouse warming. Halogens and chlorine and fluorine from crustal evaporites and sedimentary rocks can deplete ozone or cause acid rain. Thus, the environmental outcome of a flood basalt depends not only on how much magma but what kinds of rocks are being intruded, how much volatile content the magma and adjacent rock have, how quickly eruptions occur, and how gases are released, whether explosively or quietly. The timing of eruptive pulses often proves critical. In the Siberian traps, there is evidence of one or more particularly intense pulses directly bracketing the Permian-Triassic boundary, pushing ecosystems past tipping points. Massive sulfur aerosol loading may have led to abrupt cooling episodes, followed by rapid warming as CO2 accumulated. Ocean circulation patterns may have collapsed, producing widespread anoxia and euxinia, 
oxygen-poor and sulphur-rich water in marine environments. On land, plants suffered from acid rain, soil degradation, collapse of photosynthesis when dust and aerosols blocked more sunlight. In the Deccan, pulses of eruptions appear to come in two or more main events, one before the asteroid impact that marks the physical boundary, another overlapping it. These pulses correspond to isotopic excursions in marine carbonate records, signals that carbon cycle was disrupted, perhaps ocean acidification, shifts in the ratio of carbon isotopes in sediments, disturbance in marine ecosystem productivity before the final cataclysmic impact. Mass extinctions followed. The great dying at the end of the Permian eliminated more than eight-tenths of marine species, nearly three-quarters of terrestrial species. Recovery took several million years, perhaps five to ten million, with whole classes of organisms vanishing, lineages disappearing, ecosystems reworking. The KPG extinction at the end of the Cretaceous likewise ended many large vertebrates, many marine reptiles, many plankton groups. The Deccan eruptions stressed the biosphere in advance while the asteroid delivered the coup de grace. Recent studies sharpen the picture. High-precision geochronology using argon-argon dating and uranium-lead methods has allowed scientists to resolve the pulse nature of eruptions with resolution of tens of thousands of years. In the Siberian traps, these data reveal that the major lava volume was produced in relatively few cataclysmic pulses, not a slow but steady flood, and that some of these pulses occurred in climatic and environmental windows that magnified their effects, times when oceans were already depleted in oxygen or when existing ecosystems were degraded. In the Deccan, recent work on paleomagnetism, isotope tracers and sedimentary records indicates that the first main eruptive pulses began tens to hundreds of thousands of years before the boundary, altering ocean chemistry in ways that made ecosystems more fragile. The geochemical fingerprinting of basaltic flows shows variations in volatile content, with early flows richer in sulphur, later flows possibly more dominated by CO2 output, and interactions with crustal rocks injecting unique elements, tell tales of complex subterranean plumbing. In both cases, intrusive activity, magma that never reached the surface but forced its way horizontally in sills and dikes, heated surrounding rock, degassed over long periods, contributed substantially to environmental stress. These sills can cut through sedimentary layers and effectively cook organic carbon and sulphur in place, releasing methane, carbon dioxide, even hydrogen sulphide. Because these intrusions are largely hidden in geological strata, their role was underappreciated until recently. But new geophysical imaging and chemical modelling suggest that a large fraction of volatile forcing may have come from intrusion rather than surface flows alone. What do all these details tell us about Earth's future? Though nothing suggests an imminent repeat of a Siberian or Deccan-scale eruption on human timescales, the planet's mechanisms still exist. Mantle plumes persist. Continental lithosphere can weaken. Supercontinents may eventually form and rift. If a plume head, rich in thermal anomaly, intersects a stressed continental plate or rift zone, similar flood basalt formation is possible given sufficient magma supply. Geologists argue that in the course of tens or hundreds of millions of years, Earth will likely assemble configurations that favor massive LIP formation again. From a predictive standpoint, the traps show that not only volumes but rates matter. A million cubic kilometers of basalt erupted steadily over a million years is less biologically devastating than millions erupted in short, intense pulses feeding huge gas release. Thus, key thresholds involve how fast magma is delivered, how much volatile content it contains, how the subsurface geology mediates volatile release, whether ocean-based oxygenation is already stressed, and whether ecosystems are near collapse. Another implication concerns recovery times. After both the Siberian and Deccan events, ecosystems did not rebound quickly. The aftermath saw prolonged periods of reduced biodiversity, simplified communities, widespread loss of reef builders, marine invertebrate decline, and on land, forest die-off and soil degradation. It took millions of years for carbon cycles, ocean chemistry and atmospheres to stabilize. So even if future geological catastrophes occur, the damage could echo far beyond the eruptions themselves, 
in terms of evolutionary trajectories and global biogeochemistry. Also, the Deccan and Siberian records underscore the importance of subsurface geology. What lies beneath matters enormously. Sedimentary basins, thick organic deposits, carbonates, evaporites all act as amplifiers of volatile release. A basalt eruption through bare basaltic crust with minimal sedimentary content is less severe than one penetrating rich carbon reservoirs. Thus mapping crustal architecture and identifying volatile rich zones is crucial to understanding where future large igneous provinces might be most dangerous. From rock composition we learn more, differences in mantle source, degree of partial melting, magma, ascent paths, and crustal assimilation affect volatile content, eruption style, effusive versus explosive, and environmental impact. For example, basalt chemistry in the Siberian traps varies from olivine-rich pycrites to more evolved basalts. Some flows show high MGO content, others lower, which affects how gases are dissolved and released. In the Deccan, basalt flows show isotopic shifts pointing to mixing between plume melt and crustal melt, which influences how much sulfur or halogens are liberated. The traps also teach that extinction is rarely caused by a single factor. In the Permian, vulnerability may have been elevated by previous environmental stress, by low oxygen in oceans, by warming or cooling episodes, perhaps by sea level changes. Then the massive pulses of greenhouse gases and aerosol forcing push the system beyond thresholds. In the KPG case, the asteroid magnified damage, but the volcanism had already weakened ecosystems. Thus Earth's future catastrophes, should they occur, will likely interact with pre-existing stresses, not happen in pristine stability. What remains uncertain, but critically important, are the rates of magma ascent, the volatile content of both magma and surrounding rock, the frequency and magnitude of pulses, and how ecosystems respond under varying conditions of oxygen, nutrient availability, ocean stratification and temperature variability. Recent models trying to integrate magma emission rates with carbon cycle feedbacks show that the biosphere's response can be highly non-linear, with extinction thresholds crossed only when gas forcing aligns with ecological vulnerability. Thus, when one considers future Earth's geodynamic destiny, what is revealed by the Deccan and Siberian traps is a framework of risk. Earth has in its depths the capacity to generate catastrophes that rival asteroid impacts, systems of mantle convection, lithosphere thinning, supercontinent assembly and breakup all point toward periodic windows in geologic time during which flood basalt provinces are more likely. Those windows may be separated by many tens of millions of years, but they are woven into the fabric of Earth history. And yet there is hope in the long view. Life survived? Eventually, new forms emerged after both the Permian and Cretaceous catastrophes. Although recovery was slow, ecosystems were impoverished, diversity low, many ecological functions lost, over time Earth filled again with complex life. Coral reefs, forests, vertebrate lineages, mammals, birds, all re-emerged, often in new forms. The geological record teaches that resilience is built into Earth's biosphere. In that light, what Earth's future may hold is not predetermined doom, but the possibility of another trap event, if the right geological conditions align. If such an event occurs, the biological and chemical fallout could be immense and long-lasting. But Earth's story suggests that even after the greatest death, life can recover, sometimes in unexpected ways. Those who study ancient lips are not prophets of doom, but keepers of memory. Reminding us of what is possible, what thresholds exist, what resilience lies at the margins. Let Earth's future be read not only in forecasts of climate, but in the molten stores beneath its crust, in the invisible plumes rising from its mantle, in the silent intrusions heating ancient carbon, in the subtle vulnerabilities of ecosystem networks. The Deccan and Siberian traps are ancient warnings that the world may abet its own transformation, that the hinge points lie not only in human action or asteroid stalls, but deep in Earth's tectonic heart. And as the great engines of mantle and crust continue their slow dance beneath our feet, we would do well to remember what was, to understand what could yet be. If you found this deep dive as fascinating as we did, smash that like button, share this video with your fellow science enthusiasts, and subscribe for more eye-opening explorations of our planet's past and future. 
And don't forget to tap that hype icon. It's the fastest way to help this video get discovered by more curious minds on YouTube.